Well, good morning. Um, I'm French and I will speak in English with a French accent so that ev everyone can understand, I hope. And a, um, I, I've been a uh, frequent visitor to Argentina uh, since uh, uh, 1985. And uh, I even wrote a book about Argentina, which I strongly recommend, which is called, which is, I don't know if you can find it anymore, it's called No a la Decadencia de la Argentina. Uh, which was a, a, a book uh, which I published in the early 90s. I think it should be reprinted. Uh, it's, it, 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 it's time. Anyway, uh, every time, you will never surprise me again, means I'm prepared to anything. And they, uh, so Argentina is no surprise, I mean, the country is going through ups and downs. And I think this is part of the uh, Argentinian civilization. Um, uh, but to, to come to the, uh, to, to the topic, uh, first of all, I have to excuse myself with the, with the organizers. I'm one year late. Uh, I was to be here a speaker exactly a year ago. And uh, what happens is something which happens everywhere, but especially in France, is a strike. And the, the plane just didn't take off. And I couldn't make it. So this, this time, I don't know why we don't have any strikes in France. And here I am. I am... Um, I will lay, try to give some uh, general remarks on uh, economic development and uh, what we know and one, what we don't know about economic development and growth. And uh, I will start from the very controversial assumption that economics is a science. And uh, uh, I, I will elaborate very rapidly on this concept. <coughs> Uh, the fact, when you say economics is a science, many people say, no, 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 it's a matter of opinion, especially in Argentina. Uh, but why, why is it a science? It's a science uh, because there are things we know and things we don't know. And uh, so what is scientific uh, in economics is the fact that most of the economics, economists sorry, do acknowledge that there are many things that we don't know. And we are very open uh, uh, to criticism uh, uh, when, in a time of crisis, I mean, the, we take the crisis into consideration and we wonder what we did right and what we did wrong. So uh, economists uh, have, most of them have, a scientific behavior. A scientific behavior uh, is, once again, uh, to base your knowledge on experiences and to accept criticism. I'm personally, of course, very open to criticism. And economics is not an ideology. And it's not a perfect science, because if it were perfect, it wouldn't be a science. So there's nothing like a perfect science, OK? It's a permanent research, and it's kind of an intellectual attitude, intellectual behavior, to act as scientifically as uh, it is necessary, because it is a science with consequences. Uh, all sciences have consequences, but economics has huge consequences. We know, uh, looking at the past century, that a bad or wrong economic policy can uh, kill millions of people. And the right economic policy can improve the life of billions of people. Therefore, I mean, they, uh, uh, to get things right and they, uh, uh, to look at facts, and to put facts about opinion uh, has very important and significant consequences on the whole human beings. So it is a science uh, which needs to be taken seriously. Uh, as I said before, uh, there are many things we don't know, but there are also some things we know. And uh, I will focus on what we know. I would say what we know, maybe not for sure, but 99% of the scientific community do agree on certain fundamentals uh, in economic science. Uh, the first uh, fundamental on which we agree, and this will come as a surprise, uh, I have the reputation to be a rather free market economist, uh, but the, I think the most important factor in economics is luck. And uh, really, and luck at an individual basis or collective basis. I mean, the most, and the, uh, this is very unfair, but the economics is unfair. It's efficient and it's unfair. Uh, it's unfair, why? Because uh, geography is destiny. 
uh, of your family's destiny. I mean, if you are born, let's say, in France after World War II, in a bourgeois or middle class family, I mean, probably you'll have a good life. Uh, if you were born uh, in Burkina Faso in the 50s, your life will not be that good. Uh, if you were born in China in the 30s, bad luck. If you, are, if you were born in China in the 60s, much better. And uh, yeah, so that is true for individuals. And the, uh, but it's important to have that in mind because the, the function, the role, political role of economics is to try to correct bad luck. I mean, the economists can do, anyth can do nothing for people uh, uh, who are lucky. I mean, the, you, and once again, you were born in the right place, in the right time, in a wealthy country, in a wealthy family. And you are a polo player in the Pampa. I can do nothing for you. I mean, I cannot improve your life. You have it so good from the very beginning that economic science is completely useless for you as an individual. Okay? Uh, but if you were born in the wrong place, uh, then maybe I can do something for you by uh, a, taking you to the right uh, uh, economic policy and on the, ro on the right road uh, to improve your personal and collective uh, well-being. So what's true for an individual, it's also true for nations. Uh, you have uh, happy nations and unhappy nations. Uh, it all depends on their geography, uh, on their uh, history, and uh, also on their natural resources. Uh, it's very common these days I mean, to dismiss natural resources and say, well, natural resources is not the key factor in economic prosperity. This is not completely true. Uh, natural resources is still a very important factor in the well-being of nation. And, uh, of course, it's not only to have resources, it's also how to manage resources. Uh, you have countries with huge natural resources, uh, like Bolivia, for example, to take a country next door, but they, are, they have not been very good at managing their natural resources. Uh, you have countries with huge natural resources like Norway, and Norway has been remarkable in managing its natural resources. So natural resources is very important. The way you manage natural resources is even more important. And I mention that because I'm in Argentina. And in Argentina, the country has been incredibly lucky uh, that after um, uh, some disastrous years, uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, you had a windfall uh, because of soybean, and soybean saved your life as a country. Not soybean as such, but also because soybean has been well managed by extremely skillful entrepreneurs in Argentina, and on top of it, uh, the prices of soybean have been multiplied by 10 uh, in the less than a generation. So in the case of Argentina, you have the very proof that natural resources is extremely important in the well-being of a nation. Of course, it has to be well managed. And good management of natural resources is extremely complicated because, of course, it brings a lot of conflict between the free market entrepreneur and the government, but more of it in a while. So, uh, as I said before, try to be lucky. Uh, if you are not, try to follow the right economic policy. So what is a right economic policy? Why is it that certain countries are doing better than others? And uh, yeah, this is a very, it has been for a long time a very controversial uh, subject and topic, less so now. I mean, I would say that since 20 years or so, uh, there is a, not a total consensus, but a large consensus or large agreement between all people working on the uh, development theory uh, to agree that uh, you, have some th you have certain policies which don't work and other which work. So let's start with, with what doesn't work. Uh, what doesn't work um, is, say, for example, uh, state, the government, controlling all economic activities, uh, central planning. And when I say it didn't work, uh, at the time when it was tried in many countries, it looked at very rational after all. You know, Why rely on the market and why rely on the chaotic decisions of entrepreneurs? Let's plan. And let's have one central decision. 
and let's decide that the future is in that direction. It looks, on paper, it looks fine. Uh, in reality, and economics is based on reality, it didn't work. So there is the, an agreement now that uh, free market is far from being perfect, but it works better than central planning. So there is a consensus on that. Another thing that we learned uh, by experience uh, is the role of uh, money stability, monetary stability. This is extremely important. Uh, until the 80s, and this was the case uh, very much in Latin America, but not only in Latin America, uh, you had uh, permanent inflation and even hyperinflation. And uh, I do remember that in the 80s, uh, there were economists who thought that inflation was good and that inflation was a way to develop the economy and that price and stability was not such a big problem. And uh, this was a very popular doctrine among Brazilian economists mostly. They had the highest inflation and the highest justification for inflation. Okay? Uh, but you had some of that in Argentina as well and also in Chile. What we have learned that hyperinflation doesn't work. Why? Uh, because uh, it puts speculation before investment. Uh, you have no reason to invest in the long run when you don't know what the value of the money will be in 20 years from now, even in two weeks from now. And also, uh, in hyperinflation is extremely unfair. It's a tax on the poorest people. And you are too young, but some here would remember that in the 80s, you had two categories of Argentinian people, and that was true in other countries. Those who lived in US dollars, and life was okay, and those who lived with the local money, and they were getting poorer by the day. So uh, we learned that inflation is bad, always. And why is it bad? Uh, because, as I say, it is unfair and it is inefficient. So uh, we learned that free market works better than central planning, and we learned that monetary stability is a condition uh, for development. For evident reason, investors, private investors, need time. So they need to have I mean, a, a safe landscape. They need to know where they will be going five or ten years from now. Because when you invest, when you expect a return on investment, and in most of the cases, the return of investment takes quite a long time. So all countries all over the world have put monetary stability first. And when there is no monetary stability, the government pretends there is monetary stability. Uh, because if the government would admit that there were no monetary stability, it would be a disaster for the economy. Uh, so monetary stability is essential. And if you look, uh, I think there are some representatives from African countries. Um, uh, if you look at, the, uh, uh, at Africa uh, since 10 years, um, most of African countries, with one exception, which is Zimbabwe, uh, has devised independent central banks, and they do have monetary stability. And what you see as a consequence, as a direct consequence of monetary stability, you see a, a, a growing economy in many African countries. Not negligible, uh, between the 5 and 8 percent in many countries in Africa. And monetary stability has been the decisive factor to allow entrepreneurs to take risks and to invest in the long run because they expect return in the long run. So this is another uh, very important piece uh, of the consensus which has been built uh, on the um, in development. Uh, a third uh, factor which is absolutely essential, I think the, the key, it's easy to say, very complicated to implement and to describe, uh, it is today cons considered, and this is part of the consensus, and also it's uh, um, it's part of the, uh, uh, the World Bank, for example, the World Bank program, take that into consideration. The key factor in economy is what we call the rule of law. Uh, what do I mean by the rule of law? The rule of law means that you have in a society, in a given society, uh, many diversified uh, institutions which do not depend on the government. Why is it important? Uh, because government have their own motivations and entrepreneurs have different motivation. Uh, you have two markets. You have the economic market and you have the political market. And everyone on this market is looking for the highest return. And for uh, when you are in politics, I mean, high returns are usually short term. 
and on top of it, government change very rapidly. So government are unstable and unpredictable by definition. This doesn't make life very easy for the entrepreneur. Uh, the entrepreneur, once again, he needs to know uh, to whom he will sell a car or a soya bean or whatever in uh, five years from now or in ten years from now. Okay? And uh, if the government controls everything and if the government uh, is able to bring havoc uh, to the free market, uh, the entrepreneur will not invest. So the rule of law and, uh, is a uh, series of institutions uh, which are stable independently of who is in office. So among the institutions, uh, central bank, essential. Uh, it has been now largely proven, for the reasons that I mentioned before, that you need to have a completely independent central bank. Uh, to have an independent central bank is a guarantee, it's not a total guarantee, but it's kind of guarantee that monetary stability uh, will be there for quite a long time. Therefore, you can use your own money, you can sign contracts, you can buy and sell, and the contracts uh, will uh, be based on a rather predictable money. So, independent central bank is one of these essential institutions. Uh, justice, of course, absolutely fundamental. Why? Uh, well, not only to make the society fair, but also because uh, the free market is based on contract. Uh, so, the contract needs to be implemented. And the contract needs to be implemented eventually uh, in front of a judge. So you need the judge to be completely independent to be sure that the judge will apply the law and will not follow instructions uh, from any kind of government. Uh, if the judge follows instructions from uh, the government, it's a different economic system, uh, which uh, we usually uh, call crony capitalism. Crony capitalism is a form of capitalism where decisions are not made on a rational basis, on economic basis, but they are made based on the friendship uh, you build with the government, with the judge, or whatever. So, an independent justice, an independent central bank are guarantees that the economic decision will be rational, and rationality is the basis of uh, economic development. Uh, it's also uh, very important that uh, property rights should be respected, uh, which is not always the case, and that also treaties would be respected. And uh, uh, just to, seek to, to stay with the economy, uh, one of the basic uh, fundamental uh, for economic prosperity, as we all know, and I think we don't need to elaborate, is free trade. Uh, but free trade requires that treaty would be respected. And this is not always the case. So I just give you this kind of element, respect of treaties, respect of property rights, independent justice, and the uh, independent central bank, and uh, also free media. Why is free media very important for economic development? Uh, because free media give you the guarantee that the uh, competition is fair, and that the uh, decisions are rational and not based on corruption or on crony capitalism. So free media is extremely important uh, also to guarantee a long-term sustainable development. Okay. Uh, this seems quite a, uh, a paradox because what I'm trying to explain that the, uh, the conditions for economic development are not economics after all, they are legal. Okay? Uh, so the fundamentals of a sustainable economic development belong to uh, the law more than to economic science as such. But if you don't have these very strong legal fundamentals, uh, rule of law basically, and uh, you cannot make sure that the economy uh, will be sustainable in the long run. Uh, I will add that uh, yeah, within the rule of law, I will put welfare and social justice. And uh, there is no free market without any kind of redistribution. There is no free market uh, without the state, uh, because only the state can implement the rules. And in our democratic society, everyone is expecting some kind of social justice. So social justice is part of the system. It's part of the free market system. But also the uh, social justice, welfare state, which kind of redistribution, what kind of level for taxation, this must be stable and predictable. 
uh, very often you, you read and you hear, for example, if you follow the uh, uh, United States uh, presidential campaign, uh, a, uh, Mitt Romney explained that uh, lower taxes uh, is good for economic development. And Obama would say the reverse. And uh, actually, we don't know. Uh, actually, we don't know. I think they are both wrong. Uh, because what is important when you look when you look at facts, I mean, just forget ideology, okay? Just forget that you want small government, you don't want to pay taxes, and other people want a lot of welfare and a lot of taxes and big government because they don't like capitalism. Okay? This is a fair ideological debate. But if you look at the economic facts, uh, the story is different. You have countries with very high taxes and a very high level of redistribution and welfare, like uh, all the Scandinavian countries, or France, uh, who in the long run are doing quite well. I mean, they, uh, they, uh, are the most wealthy countries per capita in the world, if you put aside the United States and Japan, are countries with a very, very high taxes and a, a very big welfare state and a lot of redistribution. So how come that still uh, they are growing? They are growing because we know it's part of the system. So what is important is not that much the level of taxation or the level of redistribution. What is important is that the system would be predictable. So uh, I would, you know, uh, reject from a purely economic perspective uh, Romney and, uh, and Obama. What is needed is not more taxes or less taxes. What is needed is, is predictable taxes. Where, where shall we be in five years from now? What destroys the economy uh, is a government who would change his mind in the, every two days or after each election. And uh, to avoid this kind of a, uh, uh, shaky attitude, we create stable institutions and the welfare state is part of these stable uh, institutions. And uh, what, yeah, um, more of it. I'm trying because... Uh, okay, yeah. Um, that was, I think, because uh, uh, very often also uh, you have, a, especially in Latin America, uh, you have a kind of a, uh, ideological opposition between people in favor of social justice and people in favor of free market and, and, and growth. Um, there is no contradiction. Uh, there is no contradiction. It's all a question of fine-tuning and balance. And a, uh, it's a balancing act, basically. The role of government... I think is less to encourage growth because they cannot do much for that. The role of government uh, is more to uh, implement some kind of social justice uh, which will make capitalism acceptable. Nobody likes capitalism, to tell the truth. Uh, maybe some capitalists, and even I'm not sure. But nobody likes capitalism because it's not, it's not a nice system, it's not an ideal system, it's uh, not perfect, it's very unperfect. Uh, it's not moral, it's only efficient. So you have uh, to make, when you are in government or you are an intellectual, you have to make capitalism acceptable. And to make capitalism acceptable, you need some kind of welfare state and redistribution. Now, in order to implement redistribution and have a welfare state, you need to have growth. So this is why it's a balancing act. If you go too far towards social justice and redistribution, uh, you kill growth, okay? And if you don't have any kind of welfare, capitalism will be rejected and people will want kind of a social revolution. So it's a very complicated balancing act to go as far as you can in terms of welfare state, but not too far in order not to destroy uh, what Keynes called the animal spirit. The animal spirit, which is the engine of economy. Uh, as Keynes uh, very uh, often explained, and also I encourage you to read the uh, 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 Daniel Kahneman uh, books about the animal spirits and the motivation of the entrepreneur. Uh, it's all about psychology. Uh, just a small anecdote about Daniel Kahneman, uh, which I, I like very much. You know, he's in the American Israeli. Uh, we received the Nobel Prize in economics uh, two or three years ago, and uh, he, he, he wondered. Why do entrepreneurs exist, after all? I mean, uh, most of the people are looking for a quiet life and safety 
And why should people uh, suddenly decide that they've become an entrepreneur and create something new? Uh, Daniel Kahneman explained, but it was all based on statistics and survey, that the, uh, uh, people become entrepreneurs, well, basically because they are psychologically unstable. They're a bit crazy in a way. And, they, uh, and you know, their main craziness is that they think that they will all be successful. And so uh, Kahneman made surveys among would-be entrepreneurs, people in your generation who want to build a business. And he would ask a crowd like you, uh, okay, you want to be an entrepreneur, you want to, be, to create a new business, uh, do you think you will be successful? 100% uh, in this room probably will say yes. And what about your competitors? No, my competitors are no good, and they, I'm the best, I will be successful. Okay. So, uh, and the, uh, I come back to the same room in five years from now. Half of you have created uh, their business, and among the half of you who have created the business, another half is bankrupt. You failed. And they, you failed, but... Because you thought you would be successful, you started the business. So the free market economy and capitalism is based on a kind of self-delusion. Without self-delusion, there would be no entrepreneurship. And uh, Steve Jobs is a very good example. The guy was completely self-delusional. Uh, but it worked. But beyond, the beyond one Steve Jobs, you have... 10,000 people who thought they were Steve Jobs and they're all bankrupt. But to have one Steve Jobs, it's very important that the, the crowd should be self-delusional. Okay? So craziness is basically uh, the fundamental uh, of uh, capitalism. And uh, capitalism is all about human nature anyway. You know, the big mistake about socialism, they, the socialist economists, uh, they forgot that they were working with human beings. Uh, and they thought they were working with rational people. And we are not rational. They were not rational. They thought they were. That always the debate you know, between the free market and the government. And, uh, so economists who don't like the uh, free market say, but the free market is not perfectly rational. The decisions are not rational. You have self-delusion. Uh, okay, that's true. But why should government be more rational? Government is made with people. So the government is not more rational than the market. We are in a world of complete irrationality. And the, the difficulty and the miracle is, and uh, this has been explained by Adam Smith a long time ago, that in spite of our weaknesses, in spite of our uh, craziness, uh, in spite of the fact that we are simultaneously uh, good and evil, it has been possible today to build an economic system uh, which is bringing hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And as you know, uh, this is the uh, miracle uh, which happened, which started happening, let's say, 25 years ago. And 25 years ago, uh, it was common wisdom that half of the planet would never be able to enter into the development process. It would be ever possible. They saw that the Indian had the wrong culture, that uh, it was too hot in Africa, or in the... Uh, uh, that the, uh, the Chinese uh, yeah, were wrongly Confucianist and this kind of crap, okay? And they, uh, it has been demonstrated that economic policies is stronger than any kind of cultural prejudice and that culture is certainly important in your uh, individual life. It's not a decisive factor uh, in economic growth. Now, um, I will come to a uh, th th third topic I will to... I want to, to cover uh, because it's a topic of your conference and also it's what's going on right now in the world. I want to uh, elaborate a little bit on the uh, what's called regional cooperation. And a, um, first of all, uh, all economists agree, I think even Stiglitz would agree, uh, that free trade is good and that division of labor is extremely important and that each country, each individual, each region has some assets. And if you exchange with your neighbor, the guy next door or the country next door or a country on the other side of the planet, 
uh, both partners benefit from the exchange. Okay? This is the basic of economy. Uh, it has been written by Adam Smith in 1776. It has been then uh, repeated in details by David Ricardo and so on. So we agree that exchange is good and that uh, when you have trade, both sides are beneficiary. Okay? And now, what is the right uh, dimension? What, what is the right scope for trade? Uh, ideally, it's the planet. And we do have an organization, which is the World Trade Organization. Nearly all countries are members of the World Trade Organization. China is a member, India is a member, most of Latin American countries are, and Russia just joined the WTO. Okay? So in principle, uh, free trade today is global. And this is supposedly good, and in the case of Argentina, it works. When you are able to sell soybean to India, South Korea, and China. So this is a good example of uh, free trade working on a global basis. But also, uh, it happens that in the global trade, there are a lot of obstacles which are extremely difficult to manage. Distance, regulations, and a lot of people not respecting the rules. So the, uh, another idea emerged since yeah, maybe 50 years that maybe uh, WTO uh, should be not replaced but completed uh, with regional uh, agreements. Uh, the most uh, intense and sophisticated of these regional agreements is the European Union. Okay? Uh, the European Union has been built uh, starting in 1959 as an integrated economic region. It's basically one economy. And uh, if I were to, sp if I had spoken to you two years ago, we would all have agreed that the European Union is the most fantastic success uh, in political and economic history. Okay? Uh, I still think it's a success, but I will explain, now I need to explain why. Uh, but it's important to remember that the European Union uh, has been and still is the model, is the pattern for many other uh, cooperation zones of the kind. And uh, there, the Mercosur, which is a complete failure and which has been a failure from the very beginning, you know, even before Venezuela joined, it was a failure. Uh, so the Mercosur initially was inspired by the European Union. Uh, there are today a, uh, attempts, I don't think they will go very far, but there are attempts uh, in the uh, Northeast Asia between China, South Korea, uh, Japan uh, to build a free trade zone uh, which would be on the model of Europe. And there are uh, uh, regional cooperation in, uh, zone in the western part of Africa, uh, which are working not that bad, uh, being given the political condition there. And there is also uh, the very beginning of a negotiation for the creation of a vast uh, Pacific free trade zone, uh, including all the countries surrounding the Pacific Ocean. So Argentina is not directly concerned, but it does concern Chile, Australia, Japan, uh, United States, and so on. Uh, interestingly enough, China is excluded uh, because the zone is based not only on the economic interest but also on the uh, democratic principle. And the, uh, so, the, so why are these uh, uh, attempts more or less successful, important, and significant and interesting? Uh, because, and maybe this is not well understood, and it's very important to understand in the case of, uh, of Europe, trade and economy is not the real purpose of the European Union. And it's the same for most of these zones. The purpose and the amb ambition is peace. Because we all have two problems as countries. Uh, we want to grow, but we also want to have peaceful relationship with our neighbors. And we all belong to continents where war with your neighbor uh, was rather frequent. And it was the case in Europe, of course, where we killed each other during 1,000 years. And we just stopped in 1945. And now we hardly try to remember why we killed each other. I mean, the, 
uh, when my children asked me, but why did you fight the Germans or my father? I mean, well, I said, I don't know, actually, you know, I, but I, uh, Latin America was also uh, a zone for wars. I mean, with Paraguay and, uh, and all the threat with Chile. I mean, they, uh, so it's, Latin America is still a dangerous place. So the idea, which was the basis of European Union, is that trade replaces war. That if you trade with your neighbor, you build uh, what Jean Monnet, the founder of the European Union, called concrete interests. Okay? You have substantial interest, and then, because you have substantial interest, uh, trade is a substitute for war. Uh, it's an extremely interesting uh, notion. Uh, it goes back to Montesquieu, by the way, where the first one in the 18th century to write that trade could replace war. So, uh, behind the Mercosur, uh, there was this notion that it was a factor not only of economic improvement for the region, but it was also a factor to stabilize the region, okay, to bring peace for the region. Therefore, the very notion of regional integration and regional cooperation is not to be dismissed. It's still extremely important, it's very significant, and I think it's very useful. Uh, just to quit Latin America for one second, uh, if you look at the world today, one of the most dangerous places in the world today uh, is Northeast Asia. Uh, you have uh, not only uh, economic, but you have territorial competition today between South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, the Philippines, Vietnam, and China. Okay? They are struggling to take control of some islands, and they, uh, this is a very dangerous situation, much more dangerous than the Middle East, I think. A free trade zone in that part of the world, which I think would be a very good thing, it would be a way to diffuse the territorial conflict in Northeast Asia, the same way as in Western Europe we were able to diffuse the hostility between Germany, France, and the United Kingdom. And uh, as I said, I need to uh, elaborate a little bit on the situation of the European Union, uh, because everybody asks a question these days. And what is the problem? Uh, the problem goes back to what I said initially. If you don't have strong institutions, you have a weak economy. And the uh, crisis uh, in the European Union started from the fact that we had very weak institutions. I mean that after the 2008 crisis, every country in Europe went his way. I mean, they, Spain and France and Italy went for Keynesian policies and a lot of public stimulus, uh, which proved to be useless. I mean, it has created a lot of debt, but not one job or not one company has been created uh, because of public deficit. Germany, uh, the Netherlands, Denmark, Finland, the Baltic state, Poland, they went in the other direction. Okay? No deficit, f control of public expenses, and they have been much more successful. So this has created an imbalance uh, within Europe. And this balance has been created because we had and we still have no institution in Europe which was able uh, to devise a common European policy and a common European answer to the financial crisis which started in the United States in 2008. So the lesson that we have to draw uh, from the European Union, it's not uh, the weakness of regional integration on the contrary, uh, we go back to the basic lesson and basic fundamental of uh, economic, good economic policy. A good economic policy must be based on strong institutions. And uh, the unintended consequence of the European uh, crisis uh, is that we are, in Europe, going to build much stronger institutions. The role of the European Central Bank has been very much reinforced it was a weak institution, it has become a strong institution. Uh, I think in five years from now, we'll have a common budget and a common ministry for finance. And the uh, consequence of the crisis uh, is not the disintegration of Europe, but on the contrary, a better understanding 
that cooperation requires a, a centralized uh, decision uh, in a legitimate uh, institution framework, which, as I said before, we don't have right now. So uh, yesterday night I gave a uh, conference in another place, and the title was uh, Will Europe Survive? And I said, of course. And they, uh, so I meet you in five years, and uh, Europe will be unified, and the euro will still be there. Uh, what I can't tell is who will be the members. <laughs> so if I was to choose personally, uh, I would take Turkey in, and I would uh, let uh, the United Kingdom out. But this is a personal choice. I mean, uh, say yes to the Turks and no to the Brits. And, uh, but this, this could happen. So uh, going back to your region, what is to be learned in terms of regional cooperation for Latin America is that regional cooperation makes sense. Okay, It makes sense from an uh, economic perspective. It makes sense from a uh, political perspective. It makes sense to stabilize a region. But uh, it makes sense only if you uh, swallow the whole medicine. I mean, they, uh, I mean that uh, you have to accept some common institution and you must have a monetary a currency union, of course. I mean, from the very beginning, just to, as I say, the Mercosur never worked. It never worked because Brazil and Argentina had two different currency systems and there was no coordination between the central bank in uh, Brazil and uh, in Argentina. So when the prices would go up in Argentina, I mean, the trade would be good for Brazil and the other way around. So on one day, you would import a car from Brazil, and the next day, you would sell the car to Brazil. So the, the system was completely wrong from the very beginning. There was no economic, it make, made no economic sense. Okay, I mean, uh, I, I could go on like that for hours. Uh, where is Celeste? Okay, C Celeste, yeah. Okay, we'll Okay, so, so Celeste uh, asked me to shut up right now, uh, <laughs> which I do with pleasure, and uh, I'll be very, uh, very keen and very eager to uh, listen to your questions and try to answer uh, my best if you wish so. Thank you.